Let me start a, a somewhat unusual sermon in an unusual way with, with two related elements I'd ask to ask you to keep in the back of your mind this morning. Um, one of the fastest growing factions of the Christian church in the past half century in our world has been what many call the prosperity gospel. It is especially explosive in Africa and South America. What the prosperity gospel teaches is that as a central tenet, is that God loves you and wants you to be happy, healthy, and materially well-off. If at any point you are not happy, healthy, or well-off, that's a problem that needs to be fixed and can be fixed and is not what God wants for you. Now, the fix often involves a combination of prayer, tips for right living, and invoking the help of those who espouse this view. Now, some who teach this are simply and clearly charlatans. Their main goal is to get you to send them money under the promise that this act will cause God to bless them and fix what is broken in their lives. And let me say that in my humble opinion, if there are hotter corners of hell, God has reserved space there for these folks who use his name for their greed and gain at the expense of others. Now, others are less direct. And they're simply more likely to tell you that what you need to do, uh, what you need to do to fix what is broken, and thus restore happiness in your life, the happiness God wants you to have. Joel Olstein is a good example of this. But at the core, both streams rest on the same principle: happiness is the norm, and God promises you a good life here and now. Hold on to that thought. And let me just briefly add a personal application of this. I'm often deeply privileged with people coming to me and sharing the hard and painful things in their life. Most of the time, they simply want their pastor to know what's going on and to ask for prayer, which I'm always happy to do. Sometimes, though, it's very obvious that they want me as God's representative to tell them how to fix the problem. They hope that I have the solution to their suffering. I mean, after all, almost all religion over the history of humankind has revolved around getting God to fix our problems and provide our needs. So there must be a fix, and I must be the one who knows what it is. And here's, for me, the real issue. I feel guilty when I don't have that magic wand or those special words to fix their problems. And it feels very thin to me to simply say what Jesus said in John 16, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Let me tell you, friends, the Apostle Peter doesn't have that problem. Suffering is perhaps the key theme that runs through his entire first letter. Look on the back of the questions uh, in the bulletin for the small groups. You'll see that the word suffer or suffering is mentioned 17 times in this short letter mentioned in each chapter. In fact, there are other words like, like trials I didn't include in that search. For Peter, he's telling these Christians uh, that suffering is both normal and to be expected. The rule, not the exception. And I think that understanding this helps us understand and cope with suffering in our own lives. Understanding that it is not the exception, but the expectation. The central part of the letter from chapter 3, 13 to 4, 19, are where the main discussion of suffering takes place. Now, Peter complicates this selection, section by mixing in other topics and observations, some which are very hard to understand. Scott McKnight writes, few passages in the Bible have so many themes and different ideas intertwined. It is no wonder the commentators have shaken their head in despair. Now, if we had a series of hour-long class sessions, we could diagram these complicated sentences and really see how they fit together and where the digressions are. But this morning, let me simply gerrymand parts of chapter 3 and 4 together um, to sort of take those out for now and talk more generally about Peter's take on suffering. So we're going to first be reading 1 Peter 3, 13 through 18 and then skip down to chapter four. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for good? 
But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ as Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing evil, I'm sorry, it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. Now let's jump down to, to chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you were blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. I love how being a meddler is thrown right in the middle of that list. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will then be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, let's drill down here just a bit. There are some general principles here. Peter seems to have one main concern, the suffering that comes to us by following Jesus as Lord. Scott McKnight writes this. We need to remind ourselves that Peter means by harm and suffering in our passage. He's not just talking about human pains, about children being sassy or about things not going our way in social events. Rather, he's talking about the fundamental opposition of the gospel in society when it is confronted with the truth of the gospel. Durrani expands on this in this way. Peter intends to prepare the church for persecution. Ordinarily, he maintains, if we live well, life goes well. But he must concede that irrational persecution is possible. Even if you should suffer for what is right, then you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. The phrase, even if you should suffer, is a rare grammatical feature. The verb is the optive mood, which signals that the event, the suffering, is viewed, at least for now, merely as a possibility. But Peter wants to prepare his readers for trouble by gently suggesting the possibility. Don't expect anyone to harm you if you're enthusiastic about goodness. It should happen. Respond this way. First, the mistreated should count themselves blessed. Second, they should neither fear the persecutors nor be troubled, with, troubled within. God rules the future in the short term, in the midterm, and for eternity. If anything, we should fear God, not with a craven fear, but with the fear of respect. We should fear disappointing the one whom we love and revere. This is the fear that the Bible often commends. Now, friends, let me suggest to you that we today come from the opposite ends of the spectrum, from the Christians that Peter initially wrote to. They lived in a world that was mostly untouched by Jewish and Christian moral values. And their conversion to a radically different Christian lifestyle was both misunderstood by those around them and highly suspect. Relationships were broken, confrontations renewed, uh, ensued. Your new faith brought you real relational cultural problems. Now, we live in a country, in a world, that has had much of our culture and laws molded by centuries of Christianity. That is changing rapidly. What was once a, a Christian consensus has quickly eroded. So that now, from the opposite direction, people who no longer understand wh why we think and act the way we do <coughs> creates newly broken relationships and confrontations. Your old faith is now the source of new problems.
And, and let me tell you, I run into Christians all the time who are stunned by the opposition Christians in this world are now beginning to get. And I'm frankly more stunned by how we have avoided it for so long. Uh, Jesus said, reminded us of this, Matthew 5, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then again in Matthew 10, and you will be hated by all for my, my, my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be we saved. So we should have known that this is a part of the calling. So when Peter writes in verse 12, 3, Beloved, do not, or four, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes to you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Well, he's serious. And we need to accept this as something that will be the norm on this side of eternity. Don't be surprised when it happens because it's probably going to happen. In fact, I want to tell you, I think one of the great dangers we face is, is figuring out how we can live out and proclaim our faith uh, in a way that, that we don't get any persecution or suffering or trials. Figuring out how can we change what we believe so that we're not in conflict with our world. And let me tell you, friends, if your faith isn't causing you some problems, you're probably not doing it right. But Peter continues to double down on this and adds these observations. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. For if you were insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory in God rests on you. He goes on to say suffering isn't a problem to be overcome. It's actually a blessing. In fact, he doesn't just say that once. He says it three times in the letter. Uh, 3, 9, and 10, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, bless to this you are called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and lips from speaking deceit. And then later in verse 3, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous to do good? But even if you should suffer for righteous sake, what will happen? You will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Sufferings and, and, and trials are not just simply painful things that come into our life unexpectedly. They're actually a blessing. Now, I don't expect any of you to really believe that, because I don't either. Not when they come my way. But that's God's promise. Now, Peter makes three more points in regards to sufferings. Ones that actually, again, I have mixed emotions about. First, he, he links our suffering to Christ's suffering for us. If when you suffer, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. I'm still fighting a, a bit of a sore throat. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. Christ suffered for us to save us, but also to leave us an example of how we're to deal with suffering in our life. And then again in verse four, chapter 4, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Sproul writes, do not think it strange, Peter says, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. Rejoice, Peter says, that our sufferings have come as a result of our participation and identification with the suffering and humiliation of Jesus. We suffer because he suffered, and he asked us to join him in that. Our, his suffering is redemptive. Ours is not, but in our suffering, we bear witness to the glory of his. How similar to this is to what Paul wrote in Colossians. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Paul did not mean that there was merit lacking in Christ's passion, but rather that Christ has invited all who are in him to taste of his sufferings. To the extent that we have a share in the sufferings of Christ, that should be an occasion, Peter says, not for consternation, but for exceeding joy. The second thing that we learn is that our suffering is known to God 
And actually, it's a part of God's will for us. Now, let me tell you that I don't believe that everything in our world is directly caused by God. But God does allow us to suffer. So much so that Peter can say that a part of that suffering is God's will for us. Again, back to verse 317. It should be better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will for us. And then 419, that those who suffer, uh, who suffer according to God's will entrust their whole souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Now let me tell you, I'll be honest, I tell you I would prefer that God never willed any suffering in my life. And that the suffering that came into my life came by my own foolish decisions or by our sinful fallen world. And I realized that most of the time that's largely the case. But God seems not to only allow this, but to will it for us. Because that connects us to the unjust suffering that he took on his shoulders to save us. And I believe our trials and suffering help build us into the people that God wants us to be. I've read that the worst thing that could happen to an infant's immune system is for them to never get sick or ever to be exposed to disease or germs. Because what that would do would be to leave them without a functioning immune system to protect them as an adult. So offer, also, suffering and trials allow us to learn to trust in God, to be convinced this world is not our home, and to know that in spite of our difficulties, God will stand with us to the time when all tears are wiped away. For us, that's the eternal immunity we need. And then finally, we're told, that our unjust suffering gives God glory. Back to chapter 1, 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Just another word for sufferings. So that the tested genuine of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When we suffer unjustly because of our faith, in the end, God is glorified. Let me finish with a story of R.C. Sproul that I thought really illustrated this well to me. He writes, several years ago, I was invited by the president of the American Cancer Society to deliver a series of lectures on suffering to people who were terminally ill with cancer. I titled the series of lectures, Suffering, Surprised by Suffering, which later became a book. In those lectures, I applied Peter's concept to receiving a medical report of incurable disease. I talked to them about vocation, saying, I don't know what your vocation was before you came to this place, banker, physician, school teacher, or truck driver, but I know what you are now. Your vocation now is to suffer for the glory of God, because you are not here by accident, you are here according to the will of God. Now some of them bristled at that, and I told them that if God had nothing to do with their illness, then they had no hope. If we think that our suffering is a result of blind chance and the collision of atoms outside the will of God, then we are, of all people, most to be pitied. However, if we know that our pain comes to us by our Heavenly Father, then we ought to be able to say with Job, I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand at last on the earth. That is the very heart and soul of Christianity. Our Christian faith means nothing until we come to this valley of the shadow of death. If God calls us to suffer, we have to commit our souls to him, not as a capricious, vengeful, tyrannical deity, but as to a faithful creator. The hardest time to believe that God is faithful is when his hand is heavy on your back. Yet we are told that though we suffer, and the pain may be excruciating, it is only for a moment and not worthy to be compared with what God has prepared for us for eternity. We cannot judge the final goodness and power of God until we see the new heavens and the new earth, where pain is ex exiled, suffering is vanquished, and death is forever banished. We can trust God because he is worthy of our trust. He is faithful and trusting him is the only answer I know to the reality of suffering in this world. Friends, trust in God 
when things hurt and make no sense. In the end, in the end, all will, will, will go away. Father, thank you for this wonderful promise that whatever trouble, whatever trial, whatever sufferings we face ultimately are defeated at the cross. Ultimately, will be, you will sustain us through the hard things in life. And in the end of all things, yes, we will come to that place where all of these things will disappear, where every tear that we shed will be wiped away, and all the things that we have endured will be shown to give you glory. We thank you for what is a hard message, but ask that you will teach us through it. And pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And, and receive these words. Go out into the world that, that is often hard and filled with suffering. But know that you're not alone. It's not an accident. That your suffering brings blessing to you, to those around you, and ultimately glory to God. And may his grace, his mercy, his peace, and that promised blessing be with you now and forevermore. Amen.